glorification of post-independent leaders like Sukarno is exactly what allowed for the consolidation of power under future leaders like Suharto. When you look at the Philippines, it is also the glorification of post-independence leaders that made them perhaps slightly more okay with the idea that maybe their ruler can be a little bit more authoritarian. For example, Marcos, for example, Duterte. We regret this incredibly, uh, we regret this incredibly uh, proud to vote. Two points to set up here. First on glorification, we think there are four characteristics to observe. The first is that there's a disproportionately large amount of emphasis placed on a single individual and their contributions. The second is that you highlight specific steps that they took, the ideologies that they had, and the policies that they passed. But third, that you often do this through instruments of the state, like education, like rituals, like public displays, and all of these are intentional displays of the state rather than an organic thing that happens out of nowhere. Fourth, just as a clarification, this probably happens after death because you can't really regret it while they're alive, so this probably applies after they no longer are in power. What is the alternative that we stand for then? Five things to observe. The first is that we're more likely to emphasize other people who have contributions, for example, to the independence movement. In Burma, we would not only talk about Aung San, but also the 20 other companions that were erased from Burma's history after Aung San took power and was glorified solely. Second, we will also be open to acknowledging trade-offs that happen. For example, we will give credit to these leaders by saying that they united the country, but we will also acknowledge that they did, did terrible things like oppressing specific minority groups. Thirdly, we will also acknowledge the context in which those rules were passed. For example, we can maybe acknowledge that it was good for these leaders to be taken to the back then, no thank you, but we will also acknowledge that perhaps in the time context, it's probably not as good to have these kinds of dictatorial rules right now. Fourth, we will also look, look and evaluate historical trends and development, for example, that Burma's independence can also be credited to the British. But fifth, that we will emphasize forward-looking narratives and shared aspirations. With that first argument on um, erasure and oppressing of minority, before I move on, sure. So, arguably, a lot of the glorification of Lee Kuan takes place during the time when he was in power. Would you not consider this glorification? No, I think, okay, if you want to talk about power, sure, we'll have a debate there. It just seems probably more convenient and more realistic afterwards, but I don't think it changes any of the argumentation anyway. Okay, first argument, erasure and oppressing of minorities. We think that there's likely to be selective preferences of specific ethnic groups for two reasons. The first is that post independence leaders generally tended to draw their support from specific ethnic groups, for example, those from the majority ethnic group or those that held capital and were powerful previously, because that's the only way in which they could have succeeded at united the country. The second is that they often had to go against specific groups that aligned themselves with the colonial masses of, of, of people that held power before independence, for example, tyrants in Burma. What does this mean? It means that often these leaders end up catering policy to specific groups that they like or disadvantaging others that they don't cater to. Either it means that they ignore those that were previously against them, or it means that they actively oppress these individuals, like for example, holding welfare, not developing certain areas. We think this creates endemic and brutal insurgencies for two reasons. The first is that when you when you glorify the specific leader and their legacy, when you tell all of these minorities that were previously oppressed by them, is that this state is not for them and that they feel fundamentally excluded. But second, that state interaction, that uh, state interactions cannot be compromised because they cannot be seen as going back. Let's say that the state cannot now say, oh, maybe something was done wrongly in the past and we'd like to apologize for that because that is seen as infringing on the legacy of this ruler. The comparative on our side is quite clear. One, we think even while we emphasis, or emphasize other leaders, it doesn't necessarily lead to state collapse. Because these individuals who led the country, for example, to independence, often have power for incredibly long periods of time. So we don't think the power will disappear overnight, even if we talk about some of the atrocities they carry out. But second, acknowledging leg legitimate grievances ultimately actually uh, set power from all of these insurgency movements. We think insurgencies are terribly difficult to fight. So often if you offer these people an olive branch and tell them they were willing to, for example, look at the atrocities that have been committed and recompensate in some way, we think this makes political compromise possible. Third, that flexible uh, that we now get flexible national ideology and people can be different to identify with. Maybe the majority of minority are in different parts of national ide ideology, but at least it's better than what overarching one the minorities never like. But fourth, that new economic opportunities are now equity 
equitably distributed because one single dictator or dictator doesn't control all of the aid and doesn't get to give it to all of the Koreans that support him. Second argument then on how we reduce authoritarianism. We think this is likely to happen for three reasons. The first is that they breed a narrative that you're offering a single powerful leader for the success of a country. The second is that there's prestige to that name that is passed on even after he passes away. But third is that this decreases the emphasis on other mediums, on other outlets of accountability by courts. This leads to three impacts. One, it makes it far more easier to tap into poor authoritarian the new traditions that exist within the population. But second, that people linked to previous leaders in corrupt societies ultimately will get power far more easily in the future, which is a problem of dynastic policies and entrenched patronage that we see today. But third, that this prevents the emergence of people developing loyalty to countervailing forms of accountability like the courts, for example, because they think that they cannot go against the specific ruler that they love so much. The comparative on our side is that people are far more willing to call out, for example, uh, atrocities that people have committed, or policies that are passed that are specifically meant to consolidate power. They're more willing to recognize that these are things that they cannot compromise on and are willing to fight against it. They're going to challenge any attempts to, to solidify civil authoritarianism. Third argument then, on how you are unable to predict specific nation ideologies. We think you cannot, you cannot criticize ideologies and deviate away from those that were that, that those that belong to the initial leaders. For example, he produced heavy emphasis on pragmatism and capital meant that we were never able to move away from it even after he passed on. What does this mean and what does this look like? It looks like, for example, Malaysia booming to booming to Trump policies, right? We're not saying that this is the only factor as to why it exists today, but we do think it's probably a major factor. Or for example, the erasure of Hong San's companions meant that people don't understand how minorities fit into society right now. But second, that even though these ideologies were good, they can often be twisted. If you look at Turkey, um, the founding father of Turkey uh, essentially advocates for like secularism, right? And they didn't want to become what the uh, Ottoman Empire was. But if you look at Erdogan right now, he advocates for Islamist policies that are only possible because he twisted the narrative to make secularism only a label that he didn't necessarily have to follow. So even if ideas are good, they can often be twisted. On the comparative, we can reconsider these ideologies and attack the economy. For all of the above reasons, incredibly happy to propose. Suppress them to a very significant and brutal military degree, uh, militaristic degree, 
Indonesia tried this and this team all those, it became a very expensive project that didn't really succeed in the end. So all of this might mean that what you end up with is not a full opposition, a full like oppression of these minorities. I'm going to concede some degree of these minorities, but not a full extent of it. Second, insofar as this narrative actually is spread, I think it's spread through like, extreme influence, and Isaiah does a good job of recognizing how um, absolute this is, and we think that it's great. Third, I think even while this happens, there isn't a complete reliable on these narratives. I think still some attempts to create performance legitimacy are still likely to exist. And the reason for this is paranoia on the part of governments who never really truly believe that they are in complete control and in the ability where they can be secure in their position, which is why there is likely to be an attempt to ensure oneself by being able to have some degree of um, benefit being given to the people on both sides of the house. So why do you need this? The bulk of our argumentation. The central thing I propose is that what the top of personality of qualification does is that it keeps people happy and trusting of the leader, even in the, in believing that the dude actually can make it. And this is important because the alternative, any alternative narrative would not give one the clear endorsement of a single individual and two, the clear disendorsement of every other individual. So we especially don't like the idea of supporting 20 comrades because we think there is 20 chances of someone to have the potential to launch a coup. We prefer only one individual to have the control and the power or the, or the trust on the part of the people. A great example of this, I think, comes in, the, in Maoist China, right? Where even if you're part of the great leap forward, what you got was not like massive disenchant disenfranchisement with Mao Zedong himself, but what you got was lower level resistance against the local leaders. You blame the local leaders instead of the government. And so if you want to overthrow, overthrow the local leaders instead of the government, that's what we think is better. Sure. Would it not have been great if there was a capacity for someone to take over Mao who was clearly losing his mind and starving millions of Chinese people to death? So we'll get that later. But the central argument I'm going to make in that regard is that Ultimately, in the other country, life is about taking chances. And <laughs> 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 chances. Um, so the central argument here then is that democracy really sucks. And there's a couple of reasons why democracy sucks, especially if you are an up-and-coming country. The first is that if we are mistaken, people can't really vote anyway. So if you look at the history of democracy in these developing nations, a lot of it comes down to democracy's boundary because people weren't really educated, they end up voting for pop barrel politics, they end up being in a system of like, patronage politics, that ends up not really electing particularly good leaders anyway on that side of the house. But what it does is it keeps changing leaders, right? And that uh, ends up in a world of extraordinary instability. But second, I also think that this means that you aren't able to get unpopular but new policies. And the reason for this is a lot of the policies that need for economic growth, such as economic restructuring, are very unpopular initially, but become things that are absolutely necessary in order for the country to grow. The problem is this requires long-term thinking. It requires in, uh, companies to trust that, will be, that one government will be there for the long term. And it also requires people to kind of have to shut up and take it so that this change can happen. So at the end of the day, what we think happens on that side is a reduction in the amount of economic development that they can get. This is a real downside. There's some things to do. The first is that you get the capacity to develop, most in, in, uh, obviously, because like, um, people trust the, the fact that this leadership is going to be there for the long term, and therefore that allows them to develop. Second, I think, and this is important, the extent to which people feel this sense of individualism is reduced. And we think that is excellent. We think it's excellent when people think of themselves as economic goodies first rather than as individuals first. The reason for this is that individuals are pesky, irritating idiots and don't really want to work for them. <laughs> The problem with that then is that it gives the ability for you to get the economic advancement that you need. And look at the liberal democracies that we claim to be the pinnacles of like, human civilization, right? With an extreme kind of tax burden on the state that you can only afford because they came first. But if you're an LDC that comes later, you've got no choice but to be a bit more like brutal and pragmatic in the way you run policies. That's when we think that if like that reducing the resistance, for example, forms of everyday resistance that don't really affect the economy very large, is critically important. Apart, apart from economy, however, I think that the, also a problem of limited trust in that side of the house at the point that you know that, that changes in politics and frequent like electoral like, if frequent anger at each other in politics creates a constant risk of violence and lack of trust across the political divide. So I'm going to weigh this up, right? Because I acknowledge that percentages of success are relatively unlikely. But it's two things to know. The first is that when you are in power, you have a greater capacity to make the decision such as getting external help then actually listening to external help that maximize your chances of, of success. This is a bit constantly worried about the election that's coming immediately that blocks you from being able to cede some degree of this control to, for example, UNA, USA, etc. But second, 
The comparative in this degree is about having a chance at success versus no chance because the problems we identified earlier are structural. In other words, we think it's better to hope for one leap on you than to keep getting this, like hoping that you get a good guy, but he always be potentially leaving after five years. The second big way I want to do is that you need to weigh this debate in terms of broad percentages and broad life and death. We tend to historically overvalue death that happens most immediately at the end of the bullet, for example. But in reality, the little death that happens because of, in, of like, economic inefficiency, because of poverty, accrue to a lot more than the death that happen to minorities or death that happen to political opposition. That's why economic growth is the most critical thing in this debate and only God was able to get there. For those reasons, we oppose. willing 
to engage, right? That's why, by the way, it's very important when Isaiah told you, it's important that we deconstruct cults of personality, right? Because current leaders appeal to the ideologies of racist ideologies which previous leaders has to justify atrocities, which otherwise many people will be much more willing uh, to critique, right? The problem is that when you link past leaders and their actions to ideologies, any critique of a past ideology is seen as a personal attack on deep-seated identity and association with the state. That makes democratic discourse all but possible in a large number of circumstances. Third point I want to make, economic development. Again, economic development, even when it happened under authoritarian leaders, happens in a more pragmatic way. That was my opening frame. But two, economic development in the way it happens is often incredibly unequal, right? You privilege those cronies who supported you, you privilege those ethnicities who supported you, and nothing goes to the people most desperately need of help. There was no response whatsoever to that. And I want to point out, even if you are authoritarian, there are still ways you can take care of these groups if you do not have a cult of personality and unchecked political power. That is why I say this point about people developing loyalty to checks and balances. So things like an elected legislature, like courts who can put a stop to atrocities, like legislators who can push back on opposition parties is important because it means people can consider what you are doing in light of reasonable critique, and that means we get better policy making. The third thing I want to point out under this uh, economic development point is that I think this may usually be biased in a minimax direction. You should be more wary of incredibly bad things happening rather than inefficient economic development. Because when incredibly bad things happen, we are talking about 70 continuous years of genocide and civil war in Myanmar. We are talking about 35 million dead Chinese individuals. I am happy to have sacrificed economic efficiency in favor of not having mass atrocities happen, because those are not only principally atrocious, the sheer scale of life loss is probably larger than what we have gotten if we had slightly less fast economic development. Last point I want to make, why is it that the future matters? Because no, none of that speech was actually that comparative to all the future harms which Isaiah talked about. Isaiah talked about cults of personality, cronyism, lack of checks and balances, racism which is embedded in governments and how they work. All that stuff which accrues in the future matters and I'm going to tell you why. How do you think the future develops when it starts from a point of extreme poverty and isn't able to start from a point of relative development? No, but see, again, Sean, this is your own point coming back to my view. You're, in our world, authoritarianism must be justified by pragmatic outcomes because it's not based on glorification and a cult of personality. I suggest if you don't get the mouth of the outcome, Lee Kuan Yew, okay, look, in countries like Singapore, if Lee Kuan Yew didn't glorify himself, do you know what would have changed? Nothing. Because Lee Kuan Yew never said, I am God. He said, look, you people are lazy sods, I'm going to attract foreign capital so we can work hard, right? Lee Kuan Yew was exactly the kind of incredibly cold-blooded, like, pragmatic, non-glorification authoritarianism, which happened. The glorification happened mostly for us all. So the comparative authoritarianism to use after that. But also, I want to point out, right, you cannot meaningfully critique three continuing oppressive structures if they're always associated with people in the past, right? Why? For, because people in the past tended, because they existed in different societies, to subscribe to ideologies which are damaging and easy to recognize them as such in the present day, right? So when Democrats try to say slavery was evil, we need to address its wrongs. Republicans sidetrack that by saying, you are calling our founding fathers rapists and slave owners. The Soviets in India say, but Gandhi supported the caste system and was not supportive of gender equality. You cannot attack us, right? This is a simple comparative point. There is infinite future and finite past. Even if we have more harm in the finite past, we have infinite benefits in the future when we have these more rational, humane policies. On the way up, I think we take this.
let's call out pragmatic authoritarianism for what it really is. It's weak authoritarianism. They still have a showman, but they just need to share all the power. They still want to be in control to a large extent, but you're still forced to ally with other groups so you can't rest on your laurels. They say that this makes them accountable or like good and like providing economic outcomes. But what we say is that at the very least, instability is created because you're forever forced to fend off your successors. In fact, the point is, is that leaders often are going to change on that side of the house. In the worst instances, you get coups, which leads to civil war and the collapse of the state and a world where millions of individuals symmetrically die on that side of the house. But noticeably, even if there was a peaceful transition of power in their best case, there was never a guarantee that they would be any better. If you want to weigh the likelihood of benevolence, at least weigh that our one guy is going to be benevolent, as opposed to every mafia on that side of the house always going to be benevolent. But even if you bought that, the point is, is that if there was always a threat of a successor, if there was always a threat that someone was going to come after you, that means you were never able to push through those tough policies because you were always scared of the backlash. First clash of authoritarianism. In a context of desperate no resources and like a mishmash of groups, we explained that you needed to have the strongest version of authoritarianism that came with the establishment of a cult of personality. But a few unique things that we talked about. The first was on speed. You could always push through policies as quickly as possible, and that was important. The comparative on that side of the house was one of constant infighting and one upsmanship within a political arena. And the problem is, is that it's not clear that the best leader rises to the top. Whoever wins out in that power struggle is merely the leader who is the most cunning, who is the most good at the politicking, but wasn't actually the one that cared the most about the people. But fundamentally, even if they eventually got to the best leader or the best policy, it always took far too long and that missed the point. Secondly then, they were able to push through policies which were fucking unpopular. You need to remove minorities from a certain era so that they can integrate with the rest of society. You need to remove Chinese schools in Singapore so that we can introduce bilingualism. The point then is that you needed to have that cult of personality so that we could implement tough but necessary policies that would activate economic growth on our side of the house. So, at the end of this, it is clear, development is not indeed unequal. Because the only push they have under this is to say, well, they might give it to the cronies. But this is simply untrue. We explained down the bench that there are incentives of benevolence that are likely still going to exist on outside of the house. For one, they care about their legacy to a large extent. Secondly, they also usually exhibit genuine care and concern for the people that are under their domain. But more importantly, Sean explains that the paranoia of these governments are reasons as to why you would, on balance, generally give and distribute policies and resources to the majority of society. The reason is because history is with examples of monarchies and dictatorships getting overthrown. But more importantly, hunger is often a more proximate thing to individuals on the ground than ideology. If you are unable to provide for your people in a meaningful sense, that is a reason for why you would also want to be likely overthrown on either side of the house. So the point then is, people are going to be well provided for on our side of the house. The next thing they say then is that, well, you can never deviate from the norm, or you can never deviate from the cult of personality. And to a certain extent that is true, and it is necessary for those outcomes to activate at a release in the interim. But even in the long term, which is their best case, we explain that over time you can displace these sorts of narratives insofar as to increase socioeconomic outcomes, which leads to a broader increase of political awareness. So, in terms of weighing, a viewer explained that, that you get the worst outcomes and excesses of the harm that they positive activate on the outside house. When you have weak authoritarian, authoritarianism, you probably still also have the genocide of minorities, but you also don't get any of the benefits that flow from having a stronger government. So, our case fundamentally requires far less belief. You just need to have one guy be competent, one guy be benevolent, as opposed to the like, you know, tens of individuals on that side of the house. A few pieces of direct response before going any further. Firstly, will there's a line from Okay, right, it says that there's a competition over who comes out, and the question is do we view them as pivotal or not? But that misses the point. There never is any meaningful competition over who is going to be your leader on outside of the house, so that rebuttal missed the point. More importantly, they explain then that there's enough money to go around, apparently, but this is absurd. The reason is fundamentally is that obviously resources are just very limited for one, but more importantly, they're often incredibly zero sum. There are only a limited amount of fertile land and ground. There are obviously areas that are 
forward geography is important to the state. Competition over shared resources is the reason for why you have instability on that side of the house. So note to me, even if the benefits are skewed towards one man or one party, the point is, is that it was likely going to be benevolent when dishing them out. And even if it wasn't, even if there was some amount of corruption, on balance, he was still likely going to be able to benefit the country to a large extent, and you didn't waste any time or money on infighting or things like that. Sure. Uh, two things. One is that that's not necessarily always the case. Not all countries came to power via a military like, you know, insurgency, so like, possibly in those instances that DOI doesn't work. But secondly, they can listen to advisors. Usually they still want to be seen as quite competent. They can have technocratic people, by their side, things like that. And I still think there are incentives to do a lot of these things. And more to be, the people that come to power on that side of the house are precisely the same individuals that are likely to be military generals to take power after a coup. Lastly, then, on minorities. Here, Zushin responds very nicely. We noted that it was largely going to be symmetric. If the majority was largely okay with committing genocide and like, being racist and things, presumably their authoritarian leaders would also do the same to garner like, that popular support. But more importantly, we posit that they are worse by minorities on that side of the house. Because it's unlikely that minorities would ever come to power within that sort of game of thrones politicking on that side of the house, whereas on our side, it was likely that leaders would possibly, or like in the most instances, be somewhat benevolent and take their interest into account. But lastly, what we posited was that this was often necessary for the economic development to occur to begin with. When they talk about low-level insurgencies, that's precisely the point. They often wanted unnecessary things that you know, screw over the path of economic development for everyone else in the country. So the point is that we were willing to trade off all of these sorts of things for the guarantee of stability on our side of the house. A strong government was likely going to be better able to shut down these insurgencies, even if they went underground, it was untold by the had such a big impact on the entirety of the country. At the end of this speech, stability reigns over all else. Weak authoritarianism does not enable that. The question in this debate, as with a lot of things in life, was not which side achieved the most likelihood of guaranteed success. It was which side had a chance to succeed. It was the chance to fly too close to the sun, but at least have a chance to reach there that we thought was important for a country where the alternative was not average. The alternative was widespread desperate poverty as many countries around the world suffered in the second half of the 20th century. And that is why we oppose. Sean says our burden is it is impossible to live without of personality and it's impossible to have economic development. For the world is wrong, I think the, like we are happy to push that. But I think in reality it's quite very difficult or highly likely to be able to produce better, I think those are wins for the side of opposition. The first important thing I want to know is that in all the pushes about why authoritarianism is bad, they haven't dealt with a fundamental attack that we made in the LO, which is that structural problems with democracies and structural problems in countries that attempt to be democracies inhibit the ability of those countries to gain economic progress and lock them into economic deprivation for the long term. If that is what you bear in mind, then the question is how you weigh that against the rest of the debate. The first attempt we made was to pull out all of this under pragmatic authoritarianism. There are a few things to know. The first is that this pragmatic authoritarianism was likely to be very weak and unstable. Because Trump doesn't actually answer the DOI. If you have a pragmatic authoritarianism where the failure to provide performance legitimacy equates to the country, to the regime falling, and that's why you have performance legitimacy, then that means that any economic regression, any instance of poverty, any family, any child, 
is an instance where that of pragmatic authoritarianism gets shattered, not through an election, but through a coup. And the important thing we noted then was that at that point, who you get is, is not necessarily bad because you get the guy who's most cunning, politically, and was most able to position himself to rise to the top. So it's not necessary that in the middle of the Great Leap Forward to have a better alternative than Mao within the Politburo on that side. There's no reason why it's better. What we know is that it's insufficient, therefore, we brought the ability to hide through these times with the cult of personality, getting you through and keeping people's trust on that side. So, do we get performance legitimacy? And the claim that they make is it's just paranoia. This is a bit like more oppression or glorification. But the average individual recognizing that they only have one shot and one gamble to, to stay in power, given the fact that they probably also committed a bunch of crimes, and we're willing to admit that, will probably try to find other ways to keep themselves in power, given the sheer extent of harm that could potentially arise for them. And we suggested that at least then that a reasonable number of people got some kind of performance legitimacy. And importantly, some performance legitimacy. Some trickle down from a gooey state. It was better than no money or minimal money being injected into the system anyway, where it needs still control money and control how much of it went down to people on both sides of the house. So let's weigh this up. I posit that minorities will likely feel left out anyway. It's highly unclear, there's no proof, you know, why it's likely at the start of the place you of the time that you have a federalist system of government. And I also know that it doesn't weigh up against a sheer deprivation that tends to disproportionately affect minorities on both sides of the house, regardless, even in the democracy. I recognize that future problems are not ideal. But first and foremost, we told you that if you start from like a, a situation of more development, you're more likely to be able to challenge this authoritarianism in the future, but more critically, like, I mean, maybe you're under authoritarianism, and maybe that's not great, but if you look around us, I think it's better than the situation that a lot of other countries have, which posits that the ability to speak is not actually that important after all. But look, maybe we lose. And in fact, often, I, as I admit, you might lose. You might not get the human, you might not get the guy who has a great plan to like, bring you from third world to first and whatnot. But the important thing to note is that the alternative of what happened within a democracy will never be known anyway. The extent to which the democracy will be able to survive, given the history of Kinta and Edo, the extent to which it survives is not known anyway on both sides of the house. The extent of any of the evidence in democracies that could happen there is not known on both sides of the house. But what's different is that at least we had a chance. At least we had a possibility to get a skylight at Marina Bay, and that's what we were <laughs> Once you have such an iron grip on the state. So again, 
no response to that. And then we pointed out there are reasons why these leaders do spectacularly bad things which hurt economic development even more than slow, inefficient, irrational democracies. The fact that these people are committed to insane national ideologies which lead to mass starvation of literally millions of people. The fact that they pursue genocide because it is actually popular, because they are loyal to a particular group and see another group as the enemy, and that also inhibits your economic growth. So at best, their claim that this is the only way to economic development is uncertain, and the best you can claim is that we get it, but slightly more slow. The difference is that we don't get any of the long-term structural and trench problems which Isaiah talked about, and they essentially concede in a desperate way to outweigh everything in one fell swoop without actually doing any detailed analysis. No, furthermore, they did not deal with the specific characterization of all the authoritarian leaders we gave you, which is that they are people uniquely ill-suited to make these sorts of economic decisions, right? One, because when Sean talks about economic benefits, he isn't saying economic benefits, he's saying economic benefits for the people the authoritarian likes, and he never grappled with why that is actually a trade-off worth making. Secondly, um, he never grappled with the fact that these people who come into power often by violent military struggles have none of the requisite like, actual expertise to make these decisions and hence need to be critiqued. So, at best, the benefits are uncertain. All the stuff we talk about, the harms which we can see from the outset, fairly clearly fall to outside. Brief reminder on what they are. The fact that we cause authoritarian tendencies to persist into the future. And we pointed out the harms are fairly stark, like an ongoing, continuing civil war and genocide in Burma, like death squads which deterred all the rights, like Suharto's catastrophic mismanagement of the Indonesian rupiah, which led to the Asian financial crisis becoming much worse than it needed to be, right? So it's not like these problems are not massive, but for them to concede all of these things essentially means that the simple way of the debate falls aside proposition.